Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus answered them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. So, well, you've got Matthew to blame for that great long uh, reading. Um, This is our five weeks um, uh, of our summer services, um, and Matthew's put together uh, a series um, where we're examining the letter of Hebrews that's found in the New Testament of the Bible. In doing so, we hope that this is an opportunity to go deeper and develop further our relationship with Jesus Christ. And the passages chosen will help us to examine what he's done, what Christ has done for us to bring us into relationship with him, how we each might be in that relationship, how our faith can develop in relationship with Christ, and how we can join together to be witnesses in the places we find ourselves. And finally, how we can share love one for one another both inside church and beyond it and as i was preparing to write this sermon i was quite reassured to read in tom wright's book hebrews for everyone that he says the letter to the hebrews is one of the most bracing and challenging writings in the new testament people often find it a bit difficult because it uses ideas that are strange to us But, like meeting a new friend, we'll find that as we get to know, it's full of interest and delight, with a powerful message that comes home to today's and tomorrow's church, as much as it did to yesterday's. As I explored further, I also came across Barclay's daily study commentary on Hebrews. And it's this he starts by exploring who might have written the Hebrews, when and for whom. And he quotes another writer that says, the epistle to the Hebrews is in many respects the riddle of the New Testament, because when it was written to whom and by whom are questions that we can only guess at. The very history of the letter shows how its mystery is to be treated with a certain reserve and suspicion. And apparently it was a long time before it became an unquestionable New Testament book. As Barclay explored these verses um, from chapter 9, verses 1 to 28, um, that Mark and Trish read for us, he explores what religion might be. And so one explanation is that for some, religion is access to God. It's what removes the barriers and opens the door to his living presence. And he says that's what religion was to the writer of the letter of the Hebrews. He found in Christ the one person who could take him into the very presence of God. And the writer's whole idea of religion is actually summed up in another passage from Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 19 to 23 where he says, therefore, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new living way which he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Those are words that we will be familiar with through our liturgy of the Eucharist. But chapter 10, verses 19 to 23 is part of the passage that's being unpacked on August the 14th, so I won't say any more about that and steal somebody else's thunder. But just to say, it helps us to understand so much of the writings, and I hope helps you to feel you're drawing nearer to Christ in what you read and hear. You may want to go back and, after today's service, and read again for yourselves those words that Mark and Trish read, and see if you can absorb some more of what was being said in that passage, because it definitely is tricky and needs unpacking. 
The writer of the letter is taking us back to the times when we would have read about in Exodus and Leviticus, about the most sacred places in the temple. In the first part of the reading, where we get that description of the tabernacle, the holy room and then the most holy room, it's almost the two layers of it. This is where the sacrifices would have taken place on the Jewish Day of Atonement, the day designed to cleanse all things and all peoples from sin. The high priest would have entered to present the blood of the sin offering. And in a sense, those two layers of the tabernacle, the holy and the most holy, are a bit like a parable of the two ages of the Old Testament and the New. In the Old Testament, there was the time when these sacrifices would have taken place year after year, with its blood being shed, but it was almost to no avail. It was as if there was no ongoing effect of the sacrifices that take, took place. Those people thought that they had to do this to keep favour with God, as they, as, as they believed was promised in the first covenant. But in fact, the writer to the Hebrews sees this as a pale copy of the reality, almost a ghostly pattern of the one true sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ. It was a noble ritual, it was a thing of dignity and beauty, but it was almost a shadow of what was to come. Because the only priest and the only sacrifice which can open the way to God for all is Jesus Christ, whose blood was sh shed once and for all, for all of us. This is the new commandment, which brings the promise that sin will finally be forgiven. They couldn't, that couldn't happen under the previous covenant. We're all called to remember that because of Christ's death, we're all set free from guilt and fear. It might be slightly horrifying to have heard those words in verse 22 that said, there's no pardon without bloodshed, and that the new covenant can only be entered into because of the death of Jesus. But Tom Wright says that in the God-given regulations of the first tabernacle, everything had to be purified with blood, signaling the purification and pardon that was needed for sinful human beings. There was no room for human pride. Everything had to be dependent on the grace of God. So if that's what was true for the old system, then it's all the more for the new. Jesus has embodied in his own life and death, his own bloodshed, the loving pardon which God longs to give to each of us all. And in that final section of the reading, we heard the words, so the Messiah having been offered once and for all, and to take away the sins of many, will appear a second time. This, will no, long, this no longer had anything to do with the wiping away of sins. His return will be in order to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. Heaven is the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus will appear before God and be there until he comes again to save us all. Tom Wright again and again reminds us that the Jews in the first century would have been expecting Jesus to come again soon and so emphasises that there was no more work of atonement would be necessary. He says that when Jesus reappears, it will be with one aim to save those who are waiting for him, to transform them so that they become the people of God, the people God wants them to be, as citizens of his new creation. So that's the promise for us all, that Jesus' death and resurrection and coming again brings us new life, new hope, and joy. In John 14, 6, 
we're reminded of Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no need to continually make sacrifices to gain his trust. If we accept that he died for us, and that once was enough, so that we might live and know his grace and love in our lives, then we are set free from all that weighs us down. We can draw nearer to Jesus and enjoy and celebrate our relationship with him, as well as encouraging others to have that same relationship themselves. Amen.